So today we are diving into the world of cloud native databases with one of the most interesting paper in recent years, the Amazon Aurora research paper. Now, Aurora isn't just another relational database. It's a ground up rethink of how database should work in the cloud. And in this video, we are starting with section one, the introduction in subsequent videos, we'll cover different sections. And the whole idea is to touch about, uh, to touch upon the key problems with, with traditional databases, then a glimpse of their architecture. And more importantly, we'll dig deeper into the storage compute separation. This concept storage compute separation actually is very common across all, almost all distributed databases that exist today. So if you're into distributed systems or databases or just love seeing smart engineering decisions in action, you would love this video. So let's jump right into it. So this is how the paper looks like. You can download it from Google, won't, uh, just a Google search away. So let's talk about distributed cloud database and I'm sticking to the material. So this is exactly what's covered in section one, uh, but I'll add, I'll sprinkle my practical experience into it and my explanations into it. So. Distributed uh, cloud databases in general are became popular because they offer two key things. First one is resiliency. Second one is scalability. Now what is resiliency? Resiliency means that if one node goes down, does it affect my availability? And more importantly, if a node goes down, how easy it is to replace it, right? How easy the operations are. So that's resiliency, right? Second one is scalability. It's about it's more about uh, if I get a surge of request, how is my database responding? Can my database handle a staggered increase in number of queries or do I have to do a lot of operations to manage it? Now, two key things that almost all distributed databases do, no matter which one you pick and read about, is uh, they decouple storage and compute. We'll touch upon it in two minutes, what that is all about. And second one is they replicate the storage across multiple nodes. So it's not that the, so they do break the data into shards or subsets or partitions, but they also have multiple replica of these partitions distributed across multiple nodes. This way, they of course handle more reads. It's easy because now multiple nodes can serve it. But more importantly, it gives you, if you want to handle writes, you can do it and then have a merge conflict logic to when the when the nodes gossip and what will don't worry about it will we'll actually cover it in subsequent fix on what this is all about but in general when you look at distributed cloud databases there are lots of interesting challenges to it and some of them are uh, not a challenge but the databases are aurora which is what we are reading about today uh cockroach db google spanner amazon dynamo db ton of and ton of them right okay so let's start with uh the first thing that uh, the first buzzword that we heard is storage compute separation. Now what this is all about. So uh, traditionally when you spin up a database, what you do is you spin up an EC2 machine and in that EC2 machine, you install MySQL or Postgres and then you start to process. In this, what you have is you have this one VM on which you have both storage, the disk on which the data would be laid out and compute, which is the process which accepts the request and then does operations on the disk. So this is a high coupling of storage and compute on the same node. Right? Now, if I would want to break it, which means you put storage somewhere on the network and you put compute on another machine. So this way, what I mean, this is storage compute separation. So what you are essentially doing is you are essentially willing to induce a network call to access your storage. But you say, but it's so slow. Yeah, it is slow. But the benefits that you get are insane. So let's talk about it. So first of all, what's the role of each of this? Like your end user typically fires the query. This is your end user. When it typically fires a query, one of the compute nodes pick that up. Right? Now, the role of the compute node is to accept the query, parse the query, understand it, create a query execution plan, and then decide which all storage nodes to go to to get the data. Right? So then, when the execution happens, it goes to those corresponding storage node, gets the data, then does joining, aggregation, arithmetic, whatever operations that you have defined depending on the query, it does that operation and response. So this way, your storage layer is just responsible for replication, is responsible for durability, it's responsible for 
persistence in general and doing IOS as fast and as efficiently as possible. Your compute clear is all going to be very CPU heavy and it will do all the compute and the communication happens over the network. Now, why? <laughs> That's a real question. Why should they do it? Right? Now, think about it. Storage is cheap, compute is costly because we think storage is dirt. We think storage is dirt cheap. In most cases, it is unless you are scaling to a massive scale. Uh, it's almost quote unquote free of cost. And on the other hand, CPUs are very costly. So what we typically do is, or what these companies typically do is, like if you do not fire query, you don't need compute power to it, right? Then in that case, your storage cost is almost zero. So when you fire the query, if you fire the query, then you can get built. Otherwise you don't. Right? This is the whole premise of a serverless database. You would have heard of Neon, which recently got acquired by Databricks. You would have heard of PlanetScale, which is serverless MySQL. So they do not, they only bill you for the queries you fire. If you don't fire queries, they don't bill you anything. Right? This is possible because of storage compute separation. If this wasn't done, then if you have a single node, which has storage and compute both, then you have to have that machine running forever. But because this is separated, what has happened is I can decide my billing depending on the query. If nobody fires the query, they won't get billed because assuming that storage is almost free. So this is why all modern data, modern is a fancy word here, but all distributed databases that are kind of going towards storage compute separation to make the most out of your cloud resources. Why? Because cloud bills you, because on cloud you rent and you pay for the CPU cycles you consume. Right? So that's why all cloud native databases tend to adopt the storage compute separation. Okay. Now, what's the incentive for them to do this? Let's dig deeper. So this storage compute separation comes up with a very interesting incentive. The incentive is simpler operations. This operations, what I mean by operations is the infrastructure management operations. For example, if a node is misbehaving, so either it could be a storage node that is misbehaving or a compute node that is misbehaving. Imagine if it's a storage node that is misbehaving. You have your data replicated across, so you bring up another node and, and just copy the data, right? So operations become simpler. If your compute node is misbehaving, again, this, this doesn't sacrifice the availability because let's say you have a replication factor of three, other two nodes are there to serve the storage requirements from the compute node. Right? Now, if your, if your compute node is misbehaving, in that case, you replace it because compute nodes are stateless. There is no state stored over there. So which means if one node goes down, your availability is not gone for a toss. Other nodes can equally handle the request. So your operations become simple. When a node is misbehaving, you want to replace it. If a node is not reachable, you want to replace it. Becomes easy. Adding read replica or adding replicas become easy. You can increase multiple, uh, you can increase the replica factor and handle more reads if you want to. Failover becomes easy as I explained and scaling becomes easy, right? This is why on a cloud storage compute separation makes so much sense and hence a lot of distributed databases have adopted it. Now let's talk about but if it's so green, it's not possible. If it's a win-win, it's not possible in computer science. There is no concept of win-win. You get some, you lose some. So if you're gaining these much, what are you losing? You are introducing a new bottleneck. The bottleneck is network. Because you have separated compute and storage. Now, for every time I want to access the data, I have to make a network call. So there, the network between the compute and the storage is the new bottleneck. Right? Because the join is not done at a storage layer, it's kind of, again, every database does it in a different way. But think of it as with this way that a compute node goes to storage node, fetches all the data that it needs to execute the query, does the join and responds back. So here the responsibility of joining the data is at my compute node. Right? So in this case, what happens is there's a huge amount of data transfer that needs to happen from my storage to compute. It then does the compute and then respond to the client. Right? That's why. Right? So that's one bottleneck. Again, your database can choose to do joins at the storage layer. That's another optimization that databases do. But I'm just highlighting the point that the network data transfer, the network cost increases. That's one that could be the bottleneck. If you are handling large number of queries and the network bandwidth becomes a problem. If you're firing large number of queries, then your uh, number of TCP connections in case that's limited due to whatever reason that could become a problem and whatnot, right? <clears throat> number of open files on that machine, whatnot, like a ton of things there. 
The second one is the operations that are done on that storage node that can become a bottleneck because the IOPS on this storage node now needs to be very high, right? That needs to be properly well provisioned. And now imagine this, when I'm doing an insert, let's say insert is now writing at multiple places. So what happens is your writes are fanned out. If your writes are fanned out, then the response time of the query is equal to the slowest component of your architecture. Because if let's say I'm writing, I'm issued a write and it wrote at three nodes, right? And if let's say the third node is extremely slow, because now you cannot respond until all the three nodes say we are done. Otherwise you are giving up on consistency, right? So the moment you are going for a, a stringent operation or a stringent guarantee, you are giving up on throughput or you are giving up on latency, right? So that's a, that's a downside of you. That's a, or that's another bottleneck for you, right? So, and even if you are not taking care of this replica, but your write internally has to write that data one time, but on three different nodes, then again, you are limited by the slowest node. So your response time is bounded by the slowest component or the slowest time when you're doing things in parallel. So this makes your synchronous operation much slower and you induce a high network latency because everything is over the network. Okay. So why? If this is the case, then what was the problem? Because this looks like a very critical problem, right? But bigger critical problem to do to this is like latency, latency we discussed is your transactional guarantees become much more expensive. So now if you are on top of this, that we discussed, your database is also offering transactional guarantees, let's say asset transactions or commits. Because now your rights are going to different machines, depending on the right that you have induced, you have to do it in a transactional fashion. So which means a single commit. Now, because you're doing it across different machines, you have to have a two phase commit protocol implementation. By the way, in case you're interested, I have a video of it, of a two phase commit on how to actually implement, not just theory, but actual code code. You can find it on my channel. I'll link it in the I card below. And you can find it below the description as well. Right? But in general, that is something that is slower, relatively slower, because it has a locking phase and a commit phase, and you have to acquire lock on multiple nodes and then release, 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 or other commit, commit, commit. It takes its own sweet time. Right? The coordination is slower, right? Because it's over the network. And these systems are, because it's a distributed transaction, they're typically intolerant to failure. Because while this distributed transaction is happening, because it takes quote unquote a longer time, if it fails, then retrying and penalties and like you, you cascade the error to, or rather you percolate the error back to the user or back to the client has its own repercussions. Right? So in a distributed setup, you get a lot of operational simply, uh, operational simplicities, but you induced your transactional guarantees become expensive. Again, it's not impossible. Of course, it's not impossible, but you just have to be more mindful when you are uh, building or using a database like this. One good thing is, or rather one interesting thing is in a distributed database operating at a high scale, there is always this background noise of hard and soft failures because nothing is reliable or there are very high chances of things going wrong, things becoming slow and whatnot. Right? So you we'll always see this edge cases popping up and then retries kicking in and whatnot, but that's what makes it fun to be honest. So what is Amazon Aurora? This is the final part that we'll touch upon today. Uh, Amazon Aurora addresses all of these issues and all it does is leverages redo log. We'll touch upon it in next video uh, when we dig into the second, uh, the second section of it. So what it does is it provides you a bunch of advantages over traditional systems. First of them is it has designed a storage to be independent, fault tolerant, self healing, and it spans multiple DC. Right? That's what it does, right? So it has abstracted out the entire storage part and made it much more resilient. That's one. What it also offers you, it offers you no performance variance. Like no matter what load you put in, there is no performance variance, which means scaling is really nice and data distribution, load distribution is really nice. We'll dig deeper into how it actually does that. It does not offer any variance due to failures of either networking tier, which is compute or network or storage. It seamlessly replaces and sim because it's self healing. It simply, it's very, in a very simple way does it. We'll also touch upon that. 
and it reduces your network IOPS. So what it does is it actually give a brief, I won't go into details in this one. <clears throat> what it does is it reduces the network IO operations that needs to happen. The amount of data that is getting transferred because all it does, it just uh, works with redo logs. Right? So this way, what you do is you, because you transfer very small amount of data or rather relatively smaller amount of data, they get a very high significant throughput improvement over traditional MySQL. So they forked MySQL or they built on top of base MySQL and they did this by leveraging redo log. So MySQL plus redo log base using this, they made it distributed. We'll touch upon it. Don't uh, get overwhelmed by this. And <clears throat> this way, what actually happens is because of this reduced IO of operations per second, they get very high throughput because now less work to do for the underlying nodes. And a very interesting byproduct is the backups are now continuous because the redo logs are getting transmitted to nodes. Your backups, instead of being a one-time expensive thing, it becomes continuous, right? It gives you almost near cache, near instant crash recovery without checkpointing because your logs are continuously getting streamed and applied to all the nodes that are there. And because this is done in an async way, your synchronous process, your foreground processing does not get affected by it, which is a limitation of your traditional database. Because imagine when you're taking a MySQL dump or a PG dump, it almost takes lock on the database, worst case, and then it just stalls all the all the requests that are currently happening or new requests that are coming in or new queries that are getting fired. This is not affected in Amazon Aurora. So in the subsequent videos, we'll dig deeper into how they actually do it. Right? So we'll be digging into the section two of uh, this paper in the subsequent video. So yeah, this is all what I wanted to cover in this one. I hope you found it interesting. Hope you found it amazing. That's it for this one. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a ton.